Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Prevention podcast. And as always, I have another very special guest. And today the guest is Cody Demack, who is a chiropractor, who's also a faculty lecturer and on faculty at Parker University in Dallas. And I had the pleasure of watching and listening to Dr. Demack speak at Parker University in Las Vegas, and his lecture was entitled Bulletproofing the Athletic Knee. And when I saw that title, I knew, one, I had to go to it. And then two, probably need to have them on the podcast too, because that's what this podcast is all about, is injury prevention and quote unquote bulletproofing our joints. And we're going to talk more about what that actually means today, as well as actionable items that coaches and athletes and clinicians can utilize to prevent knee injuries, which we're facing an epidemic of non-contact ACL injuries right now. We're going to get into some of the reasoning behind that, some of the predisposing factors, et cetera. Dr. D. Mack was a football player back in the day, uh, and he's walked the walk and talked the talk. So he's also lived in California and owned and operated a cash-based performance care and active care practice before then going into faculty and giving back to students and giving back to the profession um, all the insights that he's gleaned from patient care and patient practice. And he also teaches a lot of seminars across the country with Rehab 2 Performance as well as on his own. So, Cody, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Um, what is some of the stuff that got you interested in the knee specifically or in this sort of active like rehab to performance style of care that you do? Yeah, um, I will try and shorten that story as much as I can because it is kind of like a longer journey, I guess. Um, originally, uh, going back to kind of high school, I guess, I was very interested in uh, physical therapy school, actually. So I was thinking about going to PT school because uh, I was always interested in the act of rehab slash strength and conditioning uh, piece, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I actually had a uh, a back injury my senior year of uh, high school, um, second round of the playoffs. I broke three transverse process off in my, uh, my lumbar spine. Wow. And so, um, yeah, ended that's up like, getting that's treated a good the whole one. Week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah got treated the whole week by a chiropractor and I ended up playing the, the next week. So I didn't miss a game at all. Um, so yeah, that's pretty, pretty significant. So um, I had a great experience with the Cairo then. So, but I actually still wanted to go to PT school. So I went through undergrad for uh, as a pre-physical therapy um, major. It was really biology. I, sp- I studied the swamp grass called Spartina alternate flora. I won't sit here and talk about that because it has to be pretty boring. Well, grass but, was part um, of your lecture. I mean, turf versus yeah, artificial. It, so it kind of was. Yeah, the, 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 it was really just a bias of the day, towards yeah. natural <laughs> grass and swamps and stuff like that. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I am from South Louisiana. So at the end of the day, I guess it kind of sticks there a little bit. So, um, but yeah, I um, ended up getting in a, a car accident when we were in off season and um, I uh, saw, ended up seeing a chiropractor and he kind of, um, kind of mismanaged my case a little bit. So um, I had previously probably about uh, seven or eight months before that had a, a disc herniation where I went to see a PT, we ended up doing like what I know now as McKenzie ended up resolving within about, about a month and a half. And uh, long story short, I ended up having a back surgery. And so I had a microdiscectomy uh, uh, discectomy L5S1. Six months later, I had a second microdiscectomy L5S1. And uh, after that, I kind of hung up the the football cleats, if you will. Wow. So, um, and then in the middle of chiropractic school, uh, uh, ironically enough, the chiropractor had mismanaged my case, talked me into going to chiropractic school. Great guy. Uh, it just 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 didn't manage the case. What I know now is like quality patient centered care, right? So, um, but again, a lot, the great human does a lot for his community. Um, and so I ended up. Uh, getting a fusion actually in the middle of chiropractic school, you know, 4 L5S1 anterior uh, lumbar interbody fusion. So um, that really kind of set the stage for like w- how I kind of get into like the movement piece uh, because I had to have a hard look at, in the mirror and say, how can I stop this from happening again? Right. And uh, that's when I started reading uh, Liebenson's Rehab of Spine 2, uh, McGill's Low Back Disorders. I mean, through that happened between try. um five, I think, uh, five and try six. And my entire trimester six consisted of me reading Liebenson, 
rehab of the spine too. Probably like I read about two or three times, uh, cover to cover. I was just sitting, I was just like sitting there reading in class, right? Don't tell my old professors this, but uh, I was reading low back disorders. I probably read that about uh, twice as well, cover to cover during trimester six. So I basically kind of started doing my own rehab for my lumbar spine. Um, and that kind of was the first domino over into the functional realm. And I'll be quite honest with you, R2P didn't exist within Logan yet. So I kind of felt alone. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't really know other people are out there that kind of love this stuff, you know, like I did. And so, um, you know, long story short, that's kind of like got me into the functional piece. And I've always been drawn to low, uh, low backs and knees, essentially, uh, experiencing a catastrophic knee injury myself in uh in college as well uh having a contact acl mcl medial lateral meniscus uh chuck my lateral femoral condyle whole shebang almost dislocated it so oh, wow. but i did get up and i did get up and jog off the field if you will it wasn't much of a jog it was more like a a, a limp with like a totally disconnected lower and leg so but uh that's what kind of got me into it there and so um a big piece too that's kind of got me into the knee piece is uh, uh, as you as you you know you heard in Vegas um, females are much more likely to you know experience a non-contact ACL injury and I have two girls so I'm kind of looking at them and I'm 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 trying to see like hey what's the impact that I can make um, before it kind of gets their time where this stuff actually starts to come to play you know so I guess at the end of the day that's kind of my why behind it so. Yeah. And, you know, I think so much of like what makes like a lot of really great like people in a designated area is like previous like injury, like in that area. For me, it's like a lot of tendinopathies with running. So like half my episodes are about running. Right. Um, Yep. And like having that personal connection to patients and clients, people that may be experiencing this um, and you having your daughters is such a huge thing. And good for us because now we've got a ton more information from you about specifically this epidemic of non-contact ACL injuries in female athletes, especially in like high school soccer and volleyball, basketball, et cetera. And you shared a lot of really great information from a lot of amazing researchers on this topic. So can you tell me like, why do we see such a huge differential? I've got a couple of questions like specifically about this, but why do you think Mm -hmm. we have this huge differential between male and female rates? I mean, the rates amongst males are still pretty high, but 6.2 times greater incidences in females just for non-contact. So we're talking about not, they don't get hit. They're just trying to pivot and turn a different direction. And then that ACL Mm -hmm. goes out. What's going on here? Yeah. I mean, with the, and just to, to define non-contact ACL, like kind of like you already started doing there, there's, what that means is there's no direct contact to the knee, right? So there's not another player rolling into them from the side, uh, creating that, that, uh, common mechanism of injury going into valgosity, those types of things. Uh, this is, uh, maybe a perturbation to the upper body throwing off the mm-hmm. center of mass, uh, that, that, you know, which, which can cause, um, um, a whole, it's another risk factor essentially for uh, non-contact ACL. So like that's still not considered a, a contact ACL tear. It's still non-contact mechanism at the knee. Right. Um, so to answer your question is like, I mean, there's so many variables that are kind of playing into this and like to, to kind of pinpoint one thing, like, you know, back in school, we learned like uh, knee valgus is like the devil. Essentially you don't want knee valgus. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and originally we learned that like, if you have knee valgus, you want to address glute medius. Well, you know, the, basically glute medius is a huge uh, frontal plane stabilizer at the pelvis, obviously. But when, if, if we're, you know, landing with a foot, in, you know, underneath us and that femur is going to flexion, interrotation, adduction, it's technically, it's kind of glute max eccentric function that's controlling that. Mm. But when we start looking at, uh, we start looking at the mechanism of injury, it's more it's more in depth than knee valgus, right? So, um, but in terms of like, why is it so so much higher for females? I mean, clearly there's other biomechanical things that they have, uh, you know, from a structure standpoint that that's different than than their male counterparts. But one thing that's not really considered that much is actually like hormonal when ho- specific hormones are released during their menstrual cycle, right? And so, like, as you know, that was kind of a, a big piece of the beginning of my talk there is to kind of throw that out there and. Because originally it was thought that, um, you know, 
relaxin is uh, is highest, you know, between day 21 and 24 in the cycle. And so um, people thought like, okay, well, that's when ACL tears happen. When in fact, that's not actually when most of the tears happen. Most of the tears happen within between uh, day zero and day 14 of the cycle. So it's, uh, there seems to be something, uh, that, well, some researchers were saying, okay, well, relaxing doesn't have anything to do with it. And, and as I kind of alluded to in the talk, I don't, I actually don't think that's, we should go there. I think we should actually still consider relaxing levels there. And, but specifically when I read the article, it was a great art article, um, um, that specifically looked at ACL tears and like when certain, certain, uh, you know, you know, spikes and hormones happen during the cycle. Um, immediately the thing that popped in my head is that all the work that Tim Gabbett's been doing, right? And if you look at just some of his uh, first few studies, like the, uh, the one that's qu uh, often quoted as the rugby study, where um, specific workload spikes, those types of things can basically end up, uh, you don't want to say predict injury because it's kind of hard to predict injury because there's still multifactorial. Um, but there is a huge piece, I believe, from a workload standpoint that we're not monitoring during the cycle essentially. So. Yeah. And for the, for those of you listening, relaxin is a hormone that's naturally produced by females and that hormone relax and literally relaxes and loosens some of your connective tissues. You can mm -hmm. see this the most evident during pregnancy when pregnant women, a couple months before they give birth and a couple months after they give birth, they go, wow, my joints are just so loose and so relaxed. And there's an important reason for that. And that's for opening up of the birth canal. But women during their menstrual cycles do have fluctuations in this relaxing hormone, which a lot of researchers would pinpoint to and say, oh, well, this must be a causative factor. If that ACL is relaxed, literally, then it's going to be stretched out a little bit more and more predisposed towards an ACL tear or an ACL rupture. And what we're saying here is that that's not really when those ACL spikes in injuries mm -hmm. occur. It's more during the initial onset However, like you were saying, there are a ton of different factors at play here. And I love that you segued automatically into the Tim Gabbett's work, looking at acute and chronic workload ratios. And for, for the coaches out there and the parents and people like that, what's the difference between a, an acute workload and a chronic workload? I hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Art of Prevention podcast. I wanted to let you know about a new resource that is available on our website. And this resource is specifically for runners who want to strength train. So we all know from our previous podcasts and many guests on the podcast that strength training is essential for runners to, one, improve their running economy as well as decrease their chances of injury. For being an awesome listener to this podcast, all you have to do is go onto our website and click on the sports icon and then go down to running and you'll see that PDF pop up, Strength Training for Runners. And for being an awesome listener, I'm giving a 20% discount if you type in podcast in all caps at checkout. This PDF I hope will help out a bunch of people and get more runners into the weight room with the right types of programming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Yeah, so your acute workload is basically the total amount of uh, work or training that you've done, uh, whatever sport or even if general population out there uh, trying to be, get fit, if you will, um, within the last seven days. So what have you done within the last seven days? That would be considered the acute workload. The chronic workload is kind of the basically what you've done uh, on the short end the last four weeks, right? So uh, and you could, you could kind of couple in like, I guess, four to six weeks in there too. But like if you've, uh, let's say you've done uh, nothing, you've been a couch potato all winter, right? And uh, all of a sudden, it's you know, you know, snow starts to melt a little bit. I think, you know, you get a little snow where you're from. We don't get much over here in Texas. So, um, but you're starting to be a little bit more active outside. Let's say you're a runner in your case, right? Um, for some reason, somebody didn't run on a treadmill or go to the gym. Uh, so their workload's pretty low, but they're like, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling motivated. I'm going to go out and run eight miles. Mm -hmm. When you haven't, you haven't run anything over the last few months, that's a drastic spike in workload. You have not built up enough tolerance essentially in tissues that can allow you to run that eight miles efficiently and uh, honestly, and injury free, right? So the, you know, we think of every tissue in the body 
we need to try and create some type of adaptation. And uh, unfortunately, that takes a long time. It takes a long time to slowly slow cook it, essentially build up that tissue adaptation, right? I kind of like to equate it as like cooking a brisket. Right? I can take a brisket and put it in a uh, pressure cooker and cook it. Uh, it'll be done in about an hour, an hour and a half. And technically, you can eat it. I don't know why you would want to, but you could, right? Or I can take that brisket, give it some love. I'm not going to tell you my secrets, but we can smoke that sucker for about <laughs> you know four, 14 to 16 hours, 18 hours, depending on how big it is. The process takes much longer, but the end product that comes out on the back end of that, that slow cook or that smoke in, uh, of the brisket there is much, much, much better. And fitness is no different. There's no difference uh, from a, a lifting standpoint, from a, a running standpoint, like it's all slow cook fitness. Now, if we have somebody who um, who has like an acute workload spike, and you can you see this in the running world, I see this in the uh, the exercise world. Uh, if I look at a pro, somebody comes into me with an injury, I can look at their program, and I can just say that's it. You know, you you can you can pick it out. It's like sticks out like a sore thumb. There was a drastic spike in load, uh, drastic spike in volume. That did uh, maybe the the volume went up and the load wasn't adjusted. You know something uh, from a from an exercise standpoint, you can always just pick it up, right? And I think that's kind of what's going on here with the knee as well. Uh, when we look at cycles, so like I think what's happening basically is when we have a spike in relaxin, I'm thinking that's probably something that's happening is whenever relaxin is high and we have a drastic spike in workload, maybe too much to create adequate adaptation in the tissue. Tim Gavin's research says it doesn't happen. Some usually it doesn't happen when the workload spiked. It's actually one or two weeks after that acute workload spikes. And so if you look at the day 21 through day 24, we have relaxin high. If we have a high workload spike there, meaning um, training, uh, on the pitch, if you will, in soccer, let's say, or football, right? Uh, tr training increases, intensity increases. Uh, maybe they're, they've, they've upped their, uh, post, uh, training conditioning. Maybe they changed the routine in the weight room, something along that, those lines there. If we have too big of a spike in workload at that point, I think we don't see that injury until, you know, uh, one to two weeks later. And then that's, that's been pretty consistent with a lot of Tim Gavitt's work as well. You, you typically, depending on the workload spike, obviously, uh, you typically see one to two weeks after that huge spike in workload. Um, that's when sometimes injury occurs, especially if the workload stays high after that spike. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that actually sounds a lot like a couple of months ago, we did a lot of um, episodes and put out a lot of content on bone stress injury. And it's yep. the same thing. You get that huge <laughs> spike at the beginning of a season or something like that. The kids are supposed to be doing their summer mileage. You know, maybe they don't hit exactly those summer numbers because it's a little bit hot mm -hmm. outside and they're out by themselves or something like that. They were on vacation. And then you hit that first week of school and the coach is like, all right, guys, we're doing 45 miles this week. And we're going to add in some, <laughs> some workouts because we got a race next weekend, you know, and yep. it's not like people get hurt that week. But that mm -hmm. bone stress injury crops up and appears three, four, sometimes five weeks later because there's that lag time between the osteoclasts coming through and debriding all that damaged bone. And then later on, the osteoblasts coming in and rebuilding that bone matrix. And it, what it sounds like to me is that that same issue is happening with our other connective tissues like our tendons yeah. and our ligaments, et cetera. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, I just see those two kind of connected here with, from, uh, from what the, you know, the researchers did in that one paper uh, and then Tim Gavitt's work as well. And in full context, there's pieces in that, that original paper there is talking about by, uh, Raj, I think it was the, the, uh, first author on that, uh, title, that title, by the way, for your listeners, the impact of the menstrual cycle on orthopedic, uh, sports injuries and in female athletes. Um, and, they had some other interesting things on there as well, right? And this is kind of like uh, this piece here that we, uh, I mentioned in the talk. This, this, I don't know if there's anything we can do to control this piece, right? So um, when we look at uh, whenever relax is not at its peak between day 21 and 24, men and women actually have the same similar levels of ser uh, baseline serum relaxin. Uh, but female ACLs have a receptor for relaxin and males ACLs do not. 
So actually male ACLs are not impacted by the relaxin, uh, but females are. What? Yeah. That's a, that's so, a brain blaster for yeah. me. I'm sorry. That's like. So man. that, so that, yeah. So that kind of, when I read that, you can hear my jaw hit the floor. Um, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and sure enough, you read it into it and, and, and that's, 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 that's the case. You know, females have a receptor on ACL for relaxin and males do not. So the, uh, uh, some other pieces too, and I've tried to find out why, and I don't know if this is maybe, uh, uh, you know, environmental thing or what, but, uh, some female elite athletes, um, this was, these were soccer players, I believe the, the study they looked at, um, in, uh, females who tore the ACL versus females who did not tear the ACL. Um, the ones who had, who tore their ACL had higher baseline serum levels of relaxin compared to the other groups. Mm. And so I, I tried, the paper doesn't say why that's the case. Um, they didn't really dive into that piece there. Um, and that, that, but that paper is probably back in 2011. So they should they probably, there's probably some more work done since then on that specifically, but I haven't, I haven't read anything of why I don't know. Again, it was environmental, or, you know, or nutritional or like, I, I don't, I don't really know. I'm not a, so, but, but it's just, it's, there's something going on to where like, Hey, you have higher levels of relaxing and sure enough, there was a huge connection with ACL tears as well. Wow. I mean, I, I knew that the ACL had all of the different mechanoreceptors, but to have a specific receptor for a hormone like relax. And that's a, I mean, I'm still kind of reeling from that. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't impact males. So yeah. And, and again, and again, that's kind of like, it's another, it's another thing, another nudge against the, uh, if you will, the, um, that we have to kind of consider and maybe train around. I'm not really sure, you know, from an action standpoint, if, the, if this is a thing where, I don't know if we really need to be monitoring like um, relaxing levels, you know, uh, consistently, but I think we should probably be, be aware of where are our athletes at in their cycle um, and how are we monitoring their workload? Because um, when we, we think uh, workload, typically what you think is rest, right? Well, that's not actually the case. Uh, deload should not be rest. Um, what we should do is we should just see kind of pulling back on the volume, maybe the minutes or, um, uh, you know, whatever your sport or your mileage, you know, or something, you know, whatever you're measuring in your sport, I guess, um, we should probably consider that too. And when we look in the strength and conditioning field, I mean, uh, clearly, I think this is something we could probably like start to peel back. Maybe we, if we're at specific por portions of our cycle, maybe we should, uh, we could probably peel back in some of the more dynamic um, or the volume, at least uh, mm -hmm. of the more dynamic uh, plyometric activities and kind of hone in on a little bit more, maybe motor control or like saddle playing stuff at that point. And then when we're kind of off of that piece, then we can kind of up the uh, more dynamic, you know, multi-planar things. I don't know. It's just kind of some things that they have to consider. Yeah. Well, I'll stick that relaxing sensor right next to my continuous glucose monitor on the back of my arm <laughs> so I can monitor that a little yeah, bit right. better. So we can't necessarily control these fluctuations in hormones, or at least like, you know, that's not necessarily something that's actionable by a coach or anything like yeah. that. Right. But there, I mean, there, there are some, uh, if you, sorry to interrupt you there. Oh, no, no. Uh, the authors did mention that they noticed, um, that oral, uh, individuals who are on oral contraceptives did have a less incidence of ACL tears, but clearly there's like, there's the, the, the cons with that as well from just a, you know, a risk factor standpoint with, with the world contraceptives, they didn't promote it or, or, or neither am I, but like, it's just, there's something that they did notice in their study. So. All right. Let's um, listening to some Tim Gabbett interviews on, uh, with Brett and Taylor on the Gestalt education podcast, they brought that up and they brought it up very hesitantly too. Cause it's like, Oh yeah. Maybe not a yeah, popular yeah. thing to say, but the evidence yeah. is, is there. So it's like something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there are some means by which we can modify um, some of the hormonal levels in females. Um, but from a coaching standpoint, there are other things such as the surfaces that we're playing on, right? Yeah. So what are some of the things like, um, I know the big thing right now is like turf versus grass. So yeah. way more uh, sports play at the highest levels are occurring on turf. But now, I mean, so I actually grew up in Texas, by the way. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, the woodlands, like just North of Houston. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, Texas puts a lot of money in football and soccer. So yes, you're seeing these multi-million dollar facilities for kids to play football. And yeah. a lot of those facilities or maybe the majority of those newer facilities are on turf. 
So yep. we see a little bit of a higher incidence in non-contact ACLs, especially in American football on turf versus grass. So mm -hmm. if I'm a coach, like, how do I navigate that? Like we're, we're probably playing on turf, like in our big games and things like that. Yeah. But maybe our practice field might be different or should we be doing some of our training on grass to decrease that injury risk? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a low, it's not a loaded question. It's just the answer is loaded because there's, uh, it, again, it comes back to exposure to an environment and building up tolerance around that exposure. So, um, the problem with, um, well, there's a problem with every surface essentially, right? Cause none of them are the same. So you can't, you can't have the exact same surface everywhere you go. You can try and be more as consistent as possible, um, which I think grass would probably, uh, depending if you have a very specific type of grass, you know, that's like, kind of like, like, Hey, we're, we have this type of grass that we're playing on this grass, then you could be a little bit more consistent, but how feasible is that? Especially when you're getting into, uh, higher levels of competition when just different areas of the country, you have different environments, right? So sometimes that's not sustainable. But when we look at uh, we look at synthetic turf, synthetic turf, uh, there's some pretty good research out, especially by the NFL, showing that um, there is a higher incidence of, of of injury on synthetic turf, non-contact injury. And I think there were a few uh, there were a few um, couple papers that were uh that show that no actually it was on grass as a higher incidence but both of those papers were were actually funded by synthetic turf companies so <laughs> that's always good it's always good yeah, sometimes you um, gotta look at who's paying the money to get that, yeah, that study you gotta, published you know you gotta, you gotta you gotta read the bottom at there you know any conflicts of interest so you gotta read that piece there um mm -hmm. so but i think one thing to consider when we're looking at uh turf is that even when you you have a turf field it doesn't mean the surface is actually the same stiffness throughout the entire field. You can test, let's say we have a football field, American football field. We test the 10, uh, the 10 yard line, um, uh, on the hash mark. It might be that, uh, stiffness there might be completely different than right in the middle of the fifth yard line for the field. Right. So like if you have pellets, all that stuff kind of disperses everywhere too. So even on the same field, the stiffness is not the same. Um, I, th I think the problem comes in is like, you know, if you play the majority of your games on one turf and you practice on that turf, then you're probably going to build pretty decent adaptation to that surface. Um, but if we, you know, and this is happening in the FL too, you know, if, if usually teams have, I'm sure they all have grass, a grass field and they have uh, a turf. Well, even if though you have a turf field, just because you have a turf field and uh, let's say the saints, right? So, um, I would be willing to bet if you go to their indoor facility and test the turf, even if it's made by the same company that had the same exact thing, you're, you're going to find all these spots of variability in terms of stiffness and give and those types of things compared to what, when they, they load it up in the Superdome, you know, it's just, it's just going to be different. You know what I mean? So, um, so that throws out a whole, that throws up in a monkey wrench essentially when it comes to like workload. And so, um, and Derek Hansen talks about this, um, He's, he's got some pretty good stuff on his Instagram too. Um, uh, talking about like, uh, Achilles injury and ACL non-contact injuries and stuff like that. And from a turf, uh, from a field standpoint, I think it's the variability in it. Essentially uh, you're not building tolerance, um, to everything and it's kind of, it's almost impossible to do. So it's, it's, um, especially when it's so diverse. And I think probably the only, the only answer would be if you have enough money, like a conglomerate, like the NFL is to mandate like a particular type of grass. But then, then you look at fields that can't sustain that, right? In New Orleans, they wouldn't be able to do that because they have a super dome. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm not really sure what the answer is there, but, uh, it's from a, from a youth field standpoint, it's, yeah, especially travel teams, like you don't have one place you're playing, you know, you're going all around, you know, playing on different types of surfaces and whatnot yeah. too. So. And part of that could be a good thing from a variability standpoint. I mean, this is yeah. one of the things that really stuck out to me in your lecture, because to me, I would have assumed if you're putting down turf and you're putting down pellets, then the consistency of the stiffness of that surface would be more similar across the entire playing field than like a grass field. But it seems like it's a little bit more of the opposite. Yeah. Well, you, 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 you think about the pellets. I mean, I mean, if you've ever stepped on a, a field before, especially 
um, one that hasn't been uh, maintained well. Mm -hmm. um, the there's drastic differences in like where some pellet some areas are concentrated with pellets, so it's like falling on a cloud. <laughs> yeah. Versus like another part, it's like it looks like it's it looks like the grass is a little higher, but it's actually not. It's just the pellets have, are gone, and basically it's like almost like concrete, you know. So um, so that that piece of it there is kind of like throws a monkey wrench into it. That'd be an interesting thing to see like a hotspot map on a field of like where. Oh yeah. I yeah. wonder if that would be a thing or, you know, in this one really soft spot where the, where the cleats really dig in, then yep. do we see higher rates there or in these really stiff spots that you're talking about with the grass being really high, that'd be an interesting thing to do. That would take a ton of time and like a lot of watching football, I guess. <laughs> Which wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily, right? Yeah, but, I bet we could find some volunteers that yeah. would probably mark down on a sheet of paper where that's happening. Um, yeah, and, man, I would, I would, I don't know why. It's just like everything that sticks out in my head. It's like most of those occur between the hash marks and the numbers. And mm -hmm. I don't know, just I don't know if that's that's usually just because that's where most of the those types of movements are taking place. Um, you know, from skill positions, if you will in American football anyway. So I don't know. It'd be interesting. Yeah, that would so, be interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure somebody would make a hotspot at some point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it create, create fear avoidance for the football players. Yeah. To run into. <laughs> <laughs> They're all just running on the, on, right by the yeah. sidelines going down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now you said we've mentioned variability in fields and surfaces might mm. be a good thing. Kind of try to get prepared for anything surface wise. What yep. does movement variability mean to you? And what could that mean to coaches? Mm. Because you talked a lot about movement variability in your lecture as far as hardening the joints and hardening the body for all of these movements and all these joint positions that they might be exposed to during gameplay. Yeah, for me, movement variability is more than um, going outside of the normal range of joint alignment or joint positioning. Uh, for me, movement variability is exposure to different types of exercises, different types of implements, um, but still, especially if there's, you know, some type of uh, force, high amounts of force or power that's needing to be expressed, we still want some decent biomechanical integrity, right? We're not, we're not throwing caution to the wind necessarily and just kind of getting into crazy positions and Say if we challenge tissues, tissues will adapt. But remember that that's true, but it, that has to happen over a long period of time. It's not just some exposure. So for me, I look at movement variability as kind of expanding like a cup, essentially, of what we call affordances in the motor learning uh, literature. So um, basically, I'm trying to expose individuals to different types of task, maybe different types of positions, uh, different types of uh, force vectors. I think is a big one um, when we look at. Uh, different types of exercises uh, to try and increase uh, or give people more options, right? And so, like this is kind of uh, I go back to some of the, I don't think I actually mentioned this in in my my lecture uh, at Vegas, but when you look at there's a few running papers where they looked at I mean, I'm sure you're totally aware of these for sure too. So like the they looked had individuals with knee pain and they uh, had valgus when they were running and they did like, I think it was an eight to 12 week training program, uh, strength program, and they refilmed them and the pain was gone, but the valgus was still there. But for yeah. me, like, th so people were like, oh, so biomechanics doesn't matter. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but I think what happened was you gave those individuals more options to use, right? And different, you increase their affordances. Uh, and another one that kind of brings up that point uh, of affordance and uh, movement variability is when they looked at runner, uh, another study looked at runners, uh, I may be butchering this one here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but they, lo they looked at runners and they, um, they had knee pain. The one individuals who had knee pain were the exact, had the same exact cadence. They never veered from the cadence, right? There was no variability within mm. the cadence. And so all they did was they had them run to different, uh, to a metronome and they fluctuated the metronome and it decreased their pain. And so like you're giving, you're giving individuals more options essentially. And I look at that from a strength standpoint, um, we need to be doing that as well. Um, and because, you know, when we look at this, this is more than just building up uh, tissue robustness, ACL robustness, quadriceps, BMO robustness, glutes robustness. Like I need them to be able to control and produce force outside the sagittal plane. And for me, that's where kind of um, portions of the movement variability come into play and 
Uh, it's a lot of that's generated from the uh, variability overuse hypothesis, but I think James is the last name of that and, uh, individual. So, yeah, I I recently did a, a pretty deep dive into iliotibial band syndrome, and mm -hmm. it was I looked at a lot of the papers that you're talking about, where they maybe have that little bit of medial knee drive and a little bit of internal rotation during the gait cycle, which we say, oh, biomechanically that would put more forces at the knee and put more stress on specific ligaments and tendons and things like that. And then mm -hmm. they do like a hip muscle strengthening intervention. Mm -hmm. And it's like the hip muscle strength goes up a little bit, but then you look at their gait afterwards and it's like, oh crap, it's the same. That's and crazy. hip yeah. muscle activation is the same. Yeah. Um, one thing that I like to think about is um, like the work of like Pavel Collage and people like that. And mm -hmm. one thing that Pavel talks about um, is internal forces versus external forces. So mm -hmm. external forces would be like that ground reaction force or like if I'm lift, if I'm doing like a bicep curl and if I'm doing a bicep curl with a five pound weight, then theoretically that external force is going to be consistent no matter how I'm doing that bicep curl. However, yeah. if I tense up all of my muscles and do basically like an isometric contraction and then bring that weight up, then I could significantly increase the amount of internal forces that are placed on my elbow but biomechanically, it's the exact same. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that that's one of the things that I kind of think about, because we can't really measure internal forces that well without being a bit invasive with our measurement techniques. Like we'd right. have to implant some sort of like force sensor, like within the muscles or the tendons the muscle, or the yeah. ligaments. And that's just like not a practical thing to do in a high volume. And that's no. not really something that has been done. I mean, we've seen it a little bit with like low back research, which we mm -hmm. know we can alter force transmission and pressure within the low back and the intervertebral disc with specific movements and cues and things like that. And it seems like we're yep. doing a similar thing with these affordances that you're talking about as well. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah. And in your lecture, uh, this is a little almost off topic, but uh, in your lecture, you've talked a lot about like, mul you cited multiple books, right? By mm -hmm. Rob Gray, Gary Gray, all of the Grays really. Um, yeah. If you had to recommend one book to a coach or a clinician or an athlete that they should just like put in their, you know, look at your local bookstore first, but put in their Amazon cart, like what would yeah. that book be? Cause I'm, I'm literally like being selfish and like, I want to look, I want to get the book that you think. I think everybody for the most part is like so drawn in on the hard biomechanics piece uh, mm -hmm. with there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what we need to do is we need to zoom out a little bit and see how the hard biomechanics piece uh, interacts with the environment and the task. And so for me, my bias is towards motor learning. And so a great book, um, uh, he's actually got two books out now. He's come out with a third, which the third would probably be more geared towards um uh, people like us implementing these strategies right away with individuals um, is, is Rob Gray. So um, um, How We Learn to Move is a great book. Um, and then uh, second book that's uh, escaping, escaping my my brain right now, it's it's a, a great follow-up to that as well. They're not very long. Um, there's the, the paper copies, only about that that thick. Very sh It's an easy read. Um, and then the, the audio books are great too. So I, I listen to audio books. So those are okay. solid too, but th those are good. Those are good, solid um, motor learning. And it's, it's, those are specifically about ecological dynamics. So um, it, it's a constraints led approach essentially. So, uh, and I kind of touched that on that a little bit in the, in the talk too, with the, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the triangles so the individual task environment and then the perceptual motor landscape. I, I love that. That's, yeah. that's, that's when the affordance piece came out. Right. So, um, so th I think those are, um, that would be a good place to start from that standpoint because we're, you know, there's a so much, so much information on biomechanics, but like at the end of the day, like how does, how can we actually make a true change and it's integrating the individual into the environment in a way that we, we don't have to be there all the time from a coaching standpoint. So um, those, you know, your listeners who know Nick Winkleman is right. Uh, language of coaching, great book. Um, from a verbal coaching standpoint, that's a, that's a great one. Uh, but from a, a task environment constraint manipulation, or um, or you know, that Rob Gray's work has has been has been really 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 good. Yeah, and I've actually I've got your lecture up right now. Thanks, Parker, oh, for uh, yeah. uh, giving us those show notes, if you will. Uh, yeah. Learning to optimize movement. 
Yep, that's the other one. So yep. how we learn to move, obviously a great starter, and then uh, mm -hmm. learning to optimize movement after that. Yep. Um, and gosh, I think so, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is just so pertinent to coaching and like well, movement, obviously. Yeah. Because previously we would give all of these like extra, or not extra, but previously we'd give all these internal cues. Mm -hmm. Make sure you activate your glutes when you're doing this run. Make sure that yeah. you're using your calves or you know, stuff like this. Activate yeah. your core. What does that mean? A exactly. And it's like, you know, nobody knows what it means, but it's provocative. <laughs> <laughs> and like, like in, uh, in like Paul Hodges's work, it yeah. would mean something because they literally had an ultrasound scanner on their core and they're like, no, you need to make that thing twitch right now. And then yeah. you could get yeah. like that immediate biofeedback. But yeah. Just saying like activate your glutes. I mean, I have people that come in and they're like, I can't activate my glutes. I can't feel my glutes. And it's like, I'm sorry, but your somatosensory cortex is not designed to tell you when you're getting more activation in your glutes. It's just, <laughs> that's like the smallest yeah. strip of real estate in your brain is for like yeah. your glute max and external rotators in your hip. You so, figure out how to, how to, how to just, you know, determine whether or not they're activated or not. Let me know. Cause I, like, <laughs> so but, but besides like a, a fine wire EMG, like mm -hmm. while you're doing the exercise, can you can you tell us a little bit more about those internal cues versus external cues? Um, yeah. Why tell just telling somebody to just activate their glutes when they're doing something isn't necessarily the best way to do it? For me, it's a, it always comes back from a cueing standpoint of an exercise. It always comes back to like, what am I trying to do with the exercise, mm. right? So um, what's my goal of the exercise essentially? And then how can I get this person to execute this uh, movement or exercise with the least amount of instruction, essentially? Mm -hmm. And how can I get this individual out of their own head? How can I, you know, so essentially when we give focuses of attention or cues that are directed to the body like, or a body part or a body position or, um, how their body moves during a, um, a movement, then that's basically called an internal focus of attention or internal cueing. That what that does is that interrupts the automatic, uh, or the smoothness of the movements called the constrained action hypothesis. So it actually increases, uh, it's so in, in like in dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, we talk about, uh, co-contraction having adequate co-contraction around the joint. Well, basically what internal focus of attention does is it, it flips that on its head. So it's, it's poor co-contraction around a joint. So increase antagonist muscle activity. Um, but some people might say, let's say I'm trying to do a, uh, an exercise. Let's just say like a deadlift. And basically what I want to do is I want to stand up and create hip extension at the top of the exercise, right? I want to create hip extension and not hyperextend through the lumbar spine mm -hmm. at the top of the exercise. That's what I want to do. Right. So, uh, if I give an internal focus of attention, that's going to make me create hip extension. Uh, I'm going to have a high EMG for the glute max. I'm going to, but the reason why it's really, really high is because internal focus of attention also give you high antagonist muscle activity. So mm. your psoas and your rectus femoris activity is very high as well. Um, so, but if I give an external focus of attention, uh, let's say I want you to, as you're coming up through the exercise, I want you to push the ground down through the earth to create full hip extension. That would be considered a distal external focus. Um, that is going to give me high glute max activity, but not as high glute max activity as an internal focus of attention because the external focus of attention now does not have the psoas or the rectus femoris activity. So it's not having a good enough fist fight with the antagonist, essentially. Yeah. It's clean, it's cleaner, it's smoother, it's more authentic. Um, and that's like the the most rudimentary level of cueing, essentially, uh, from a from an uh, external focus of attention standpoint. Now, when we uh when you're looking at more holistic movements or uh more uh let's say functional movements or more dynamic movements. Or let's say you're you're uh, starting to like organize portion of practice. Um, you, you don't want, you want the cues to be a little bit more exploratory, a little bit more about the environment. And mm -hmm. honestly, you want your cues and direct the person or the athlete's attention to potential affordances. Don't say you, you shouldn't say, "Hey, don't do this, do this." You should say, "Okay, we did that. That happened. Did 
what about over here? Do you see anything over here in this area? And so like maybe they can start picking up things that you kind of direct their attention to an area, but the individual is still making the decision to go do that, let's say, right? That brings up the whole the whole um, monkey wrench uh, that I talked about at the very end of the talk when it comes to like practice schedule and how you organize practice actually reducing knee injury risk factors as well. So I kind of bounce around a little bit there from a queuing standpoint, but um, but yeah, hopefully I can answer your question. Oh, definitely. Of, you know, um, external cueing. So like the internal cue might accomplish what we want, activate your glutes. Yeah. The activity yeah. of that muscle is going to go up, but the activity mm -hmm. of the other muscles that kind of goes back to that internal forces argument too. Yeah. The yep. internal forces on that joint are going to be far more because mm -hmm. you're co-contracting other muscles that mm -hmm. don't work well with the glutes or maybe work yeah. against the glutes. Yeah. And that I do, I do need to kind of point something out here too, because there's yeah. a, there, there's a, uh, sometimes there's confusion on internal focus of attention to execute a movement and intrinsic sensation. Oh, those are, yes. those are two, those are two different things. That's so, yeah. so an internal focus of attention is thinking about a body part to execute a movement An intrinsic sensation would be, you feel your glutes on fire after doing an exercise, Yeah, right? We want the person to be able to sense things internally. We want them to be able to feel things, right? So let's say we have a chronic low back case. Mm -hmm. uh, they only feel the low back. They never quote, feel the glutes, right? Okay. We do an exercise that fires up the glutes. And uh, at the end, we say, "Did you, how is that? Did you feel anything? You say, yeah, I felt my glutes on fire. Like, awesome. That is great. We love that there. Right. Yeah. And so like, we want them to feel that that is different than thinking about your body to execute an action or movement. So sometimes those get, those get kind of tripped up because even in the constraints led approach, um, um, literature, you need, you need the feedback from the athlete. How did that feel? Uh, I felt like I was doing this and this, right? Okay. Well, let's, uh, instead of like focusing on their body to do it, mm -hmm. let's focus on the environment or give them a different, different thing in the, uh, you know, and the, uh, on the field to focus on. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, we start relating. So, cause they need that auto, they need to kind of be able to like automatically make shifts and changes themselves. Right. But sometimes they just need a little nudge and guidance on what does that actually mean? Where should I go from here? And we don't tell them the solution. We try and guide them towards the solution. So I, I did want to bring that up about, uh, um, internal focus of attention, intrinsic sensation. So those are, those are two different things and both are important to understand, right? So that was something that I really hadn't taken the time to thought theoretically, like kind of tease apart in my mind. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah. and I feel like one good, um, one good example that I've heard with like runners in particular, well, one thing we know that if we give a bunch of internal cues with running, like, Oh, use your glutes or something like that, then it actually decreases running economy. Mm -hmm. And it decreases the running economy about the same or more than getting super shoes. So if you're getting super shoes, <laughs> you're spending 250 bucks on those. And you're also using this like internal focus uh, for your running gait. And you're doing that for the entire marathon. You're actually just negating all of that 250 yep. bucks you just spent. Yep. Um, one that I I've heard. Burn, burning well, more calories as well. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and not in a good way either. Right? Yeah. So it's, yeah. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to fade faster. So. Um, so one thing I've heard is instead of telling someone to land lighter with their mm -hmm. foot strikes or footfalls to make less sound, what do you think yep. of that cue? That's a great cue. Uh, so it's not telling them how to do it. It's giving them a goal and they have to search for the solution. That's that's an ideal cue for running, right? Or like anything is you kind of give you give them, basically that's called a task constraint, by the way, mm -hmm. in, the, in the constraints led approach. Um, so that you give them some, like a rule or um, or like a kind of parameter. Like a challenge. But then the, the challenge, but the person's searching for that solution. You're not telling them how to do it. You're not telling them how fast to go. You're not telling them what foot strike to use. They're searching for the solution. That is an ideal cue. And they're because figuring it out, which is yeah, what learning really is. Exactly. They're searching for the environment. And the, the cool thing about that is that is going to stick. It's going to be more stickier than any other cue or any other thing you do from a hard biomechanical standpoint or heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe, or like, you know, anything, any type of cue that from that standpoint, 
you have to be there in order for that movement to to um to uh to come out right and so that's kind of one of the the conversations i have sometimes with coaches physical therapists and chiropractors about cueing is like they'll tell me okay so i'm not supposed to tell somebody how to move their body or what you know position of their leg and their knee and stuff like that and look at that movement right there can you tell does that look good so, yeah it looks pretty good well i just did that with my words how can you tell me that that's a bad thing so, okay coach let's, let's take a breath here let's remove you from the equation Next week when we come back, is that going to be exactly the same? And the answer is going to be no, because they would have to tell the person how to do it again. That's That would be the problem with a motor learning standpoint. Internal focus of attention promotes motor performance. It doesn't promote motor learning. And what, the difference between those two things are retention, right? And so like the, the piece that you talked about, having the person search for the solution, that promotes motor learning. They might not get it right away. Yeah. It might take them a little bit longer for them to kind of get it, but when they get it, they get it. They retain mm -hmm. it and it's going to be there without you having to run by them by their side. Cause you could, you only run so many miles a week. You can't do that with all your patients. You know what I mean? So yeah, and it's a lot less than it used to be. That's for sure. <laughs> and I more think, than me, more than me. So. <laughs> going back to Tim Hewitt's work, like one of the things that he found is that people land really stiffly. Yeah. So stiff landing. Yeah. with that stiff landing, you like I've had, mm -hmm. you know, like 16 year old volleyball players in my office and I have them hop off of a 12 inch step and it mm -hmm. sounds like an elephant fell over in the woods or something, yeah. you know, yep. and that's just that super stiff landing. And I tell them, do that same jump, but don't make any sound at all. Mm -hmm. And then it's forcing you know, the first couple of times they're like, how do you, what do you mean? And then I do it and they're like, well, how do you do it? You know? And I'm like, well, you got to yeah. figure it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that just yeah. goes to that learning piece that you're talking about so eloquently. Yeah. 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 Especially when you get into like uh dynamic piece, pieces like that from for specific sports specific things to the I think I kind of touched it on the end the, the the talk in Vegas. Um your demonstration to the, of those things are so important. Mm -hmm. Actually arguably more important than verbally telling like guiding them of what to do. Yeah, I mean, so if you're, yeah. mirror neurons are firing and all those yep. different things, just watching somebody. So make sure that you're showing off your exercises as well. Now, you, we talked about variability and increasing yeah. affordances. Mm -hmm. And one thing I would really like to talk about is getting outside of the sagittal plane. Now, I see that you have a, a an addendum to that too. What were you? Yeah, so uh, no, no. I, I mean, the getting outside of the sagittal plane is probably one of the things that... Um, some people think they're doing, um, they may be moving outside the sagittal plane, but I don't think they're truly loading outside the sagittal plane. Because a lot of times people will be moving in the frontal or coronal plane, they'll be moving in the transverse plane, but the load that they're having in their hands, they can be twisting it and moving it, but usually it's still going, it's, it's fighting gravity, right? So it's mm -hmm. still loading in a sagittal plane. We need to find exercises that force you and apply force in the frontal plane, you know, and some of the, you know, all the things that I do from that standpoint, I learned from uh, Koichi Sato, uh, who's, um, I believe he's a head of performance for Jap uh, Japan's uh, uh, national basketball, like oversees all their, their performance things. And um, when he was here in America, he was, the uh, while he was the, um, I think he was the strength coach for the, the T-Wolves for a period of time. Uh, and he used to come out to to LA and uh, along with Craig Liebenson did his uh, frontal plane workshops. And I'll be, to, I'll be honest with you, it was one of the more, it was one of the better workshops and seminars I've ever been to, um, you know, being from Japan, uh, he could speak English, but it was still, it's still a second language. Right. And so watching him coach was one of the most amazing things because he had to find a way not to use his words, but to use the environment and load and stuff like that. And it was really, it was really enlightening to to me really to see how he coached. Um, and, uh, but the exercises that he applied with his athletes, you know, in Minnesota at the time, and I'm sure he's doing the same at, in Japan, um, like not a lot of people are doing, you know, and, uh, one thing that I guess is not there as well is force, um, looking at the data from like force distribution on those things during those types of exercises that are truly loading in the frontal plane. Uh, using the cable machine and the strap and stuff. And Exos uses a, uses a lot of those things too. And I believe that's actually where Koichi might have learned that uh, from uh, Exos and uh, really Vasil Kronos' uh, uh, physical industry, industry's uh, functional training strap. So um, 
but there's not a lot of data on that. And that's actually uh, something that I'm kind of, we're looking into start doing actually uh, in the future. Uh, uh, Parker a little bit is kind of a dip her toe in the water of kind of looking those those uh, force profiles with some of those exercises to get some data on that and see see if we can start creating some t tissue adaptation from that standpoint. So. Yeah, I I think next time uh, Dr. Morgan needs to give you a little bit more time for your for your talk. This need, this <laughs> sounds like it needs to be a three hour workshop. Just start with what you already did, and then the last yeah. two hours we just need to dive into like how to do this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've got uh, more doing the same talk in Orlando actually coming up here. Uh, it's going to be two hours, um, oh, so okay. I'll have an extra. Well, I'll have an extra hour. Here. Yeah, have an extra hour, and then uh, but I'm actually kind of expanding the talk. Um, I'm probably going to do about a day and a half workshop now. Oh, on it and kind of get into it and expand expand outside of just uh non-contact acl and just get into like other other things as well in the knee and stuff and mm -hmm. you know that you mentioned the title originally bulletproof in the athletic knee it is 100 percent a clickbait title <laughs> it, it is for sure it, it did exactly what it was meant to do to get you into the into the room uh, yeah as you as you know within the first you know the first sentence it's uh you've been you know you've been bamboozled there's no way to to bulletproof necessarily something we could do our best though to mitigate as much as we can so oh don't worry um having in the an, a podcast named the art of prevention people <laughs> people have let me know cody that yeah. you can't yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't prevent it's, every injury it's context it's context it's context it's yeah. context yeah. Uh, i know uh, we can uh, we can still try <laughs> Unfortunately, the art of risk reduction and mitigation really doesn't roll off the tongue as well, does it? Doesn't sound that good. It's, <laughs> it's not a sexy title, right? It's not. It's not. It's not provocative, you know. Um, so, wow, you. I mean, I think I have more personal notes than I've ever written down on for a podcast before. Uh, so I'm going to be following up on those things, and I'll be linking to things in the show notes. Um, uh, Doctor Demack, we've talked about so many different things. Uh, regarding the knee and everything from hormonal influences to chronic and workload, chronic and acute workload ratios to all these different things. But if we could sum up this, I mean, we've been talking for over 50 minutes now, and we yep. could go keep going for another two, three hours, I think. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely going to have to have you back on. Uh, Sounds good. But if we could sum up this into just a little ounce, a little ounce mm -hmm. of prevention which was started by Ben Franklin for the volunteer fire department in Philadelphia, uh, mm -hmm. which an ounce of prevention might keep your house from burning down. And today the ounce of prevention might keep your knee from exploding. What would you tell <laughs> athletes or coaches or clinicians? Well, um, I think I would probably have a, a, uh, a somebody, something for, for everybody actually. Um, so from athlete standpoint, um, I think one thing you need to do is understand that uh, tissue adaptation takes a long time and you have to be patient and you have to be persistent. Uh, there's not a lot of legal things you can do to speed that up. Right. And so even, even the illegal things have their, have their, uh, their setbacks and their, their kind of hiccups as well. Right. So uh, it takes a long time to create the tissue adaptation. You have to be persistent from a, uh, a coach standpoint let's talk about um maybe not even a strength coach but an actual coach coach right understand that there are some there's actually three solid articles a couple uh, i think two with uh with soccer and then one with basketball or maybe one with soccer two with basketball i can't remember off the top of my head that integrate just purely motor learning different motor learning strategies that reduce acl injury risk factors in testing um, that's just how you structure practice only. Right. Um, now we look at the strength coach piece. I think the, um, the key with from a strength coach is now, how can we start to, um, break free of the sagittal plane and start to truly load in the frontal and transverse plane from a, uh, from a force standpoint, where's the load pulling me and what are my joint angles and, and force production angles as we do those things. And from a chiropractor and physical therapist standpoint, you got to know it all. Essentially, you got to know. You don't have to know it all, but you have to know the pieces of all the moving parts. Be learning it all, right? That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. So, your tissue adaptation piece from the athlete standpoint, the motor learning piece, and how you, um, you know, how uh, what's the coach doing in the practice, so you can kind of we can uh, you know, help the athlete move forward in their, uh, um, you know, their training. And then uh, the, definitely the strength piece, because honestly, like the the 
there should be a very um I don't want to say very blurry line, but there should be the the line should be kind of like overlapping, overlapping significantly when it comes to our the care we're providing. And then uh, the ideal scenario is that you have a strength coach or a personal trainer you can get with your, um, you know, with that the athlete with. So uh, it's a little bit more than an ounce, uh, but I think um, keeping in the bird's eye view is like kind of. Um, being able to communicate with those, with those individuals, because at the end of the day, that's who's, uh, your athletes are going to benefit the most from, um, in terms of tissue adaptation, I'll take quote, a, injury, injury prevention. You know? <laughs> I'll take a pound of prevention any day. <laughs> where, where can people find yeah. you to go to some of your lectures or like, do you have a speaking schedule or anything like that? Yeah, I don't have anything up, up right now. We're actually getting ready. I'm getting ready to kind of the, get that started here soon. Okay. So I'll, I'll be, um, you know, right now I'm just, uh, the only Instagram formerly I'm on right now is, uh, it's called fake max perform Cairo. <laughs> I saw that <laughs> our practice used to be max maximum performance chiropractic in California. And yeah. so I started, started a satirical page of fake max perform Cairo or just do a bunch of funny stuff. So that's currently where I'm only at right now on Instagram, but, um, I'm going to be starting with, um, kind of like a, a, basically a site and, places to sign up and stuff like that so uh, right now um we got i have a workshop planned it looks like it's going to be at the end of july in uh southern california so we'll, uh and it'll be it'll be bulletproof in the athletic name so it'll be a day and a half out in socal so um that's probably going to open up for registration here in the next uh probably within the next week so okay well i'll try and get this out uh around then so then more people can learn more about this. Obviously we have so many other things to talk about, uh, that it deserves a day and a half or a couple of days of workshopping. Takes a while. Yep. Yep. And, and, and the goal of that is, is try and be as much workshop as possible. So like you know, rubber hitting the road, exercise, coaching strategies, those types of things. And obviously the didactic portion is important, but we want to get people moving and feel it. Yeah. Feel awesome. the glutes. Feel you the know. glutes. That's the, th uh, that's what everybody should take away from today. Feel the glutes. <laughs> Feel the glutes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cody. Um, I'm looking forward to having you on again. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward time. to reading a couple of these books and some more articles uh, from your, from your lecture and from what you've told me today. Awesome. Sounds good. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, look forward to having you on any, anytime. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Art of Prevention podcast. If you did enjoy and or benefit from some of the information in this podcast, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast. Or please give us a five-star review on any platform that you find podcasts. One thing to note that this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. No patient is formed, and if you are having any difficulty, pain, discomfort, etc., with any of the movements or ideas described within this podcast, please seek the help of a qualified and board-certified medical professional, such as your medical doctor or a sports chiropractor, physical therapist, etc.